just jump into it. That's kind of how the Nugget reviews go. You just kind of go with it. Well, that's, I mean, that's how you got to do it. Sometimes you just got to jump in, feet first in the 30 foot part of the pool when you can't swim at all. Never exactly. been in shallow. Never, never even stepped in the pool. Yeah. Speaking of stepping out of the pool, fresh off a, a run at Darlington, you got to be joined by. <laughs> I know, right? Like, how many times do you get interviewed <laughs> after a race weekend, dude? Like, seriously. Yeah, that's this is a first. Um, yeah, it was a it was a it was a really good week. It was a really good day, really good race. It sucks that it ended the way it did, um, especially when it could have been a whole lot better. Um, but that's just how racing is. It's so unpredictable. You could be running, you could be having your career happen in a flash. So, um, really good race, really good race car, untimely. Untimely and unfair ending, but it just happens. <laughs> yeah, it's racing. It's uh, it's as real as it gets. Sometimes you you learn to uh, accept that more because of those experiences in racing. Uh, you, you speak of the fast run you had. Uh, like talk about uh, just you know running with uh, JD Motorsports this year. You know, you obviously have your own set of goals when you go out there and run with the equipment you're in. So what's it like been running with this team so far in 2020? Yeah. Um... It's been really, it's been honestly a career changing experience. Um, I've enjoyed every single bit of it. Um, running with Johnny Davis and the team over there, they, they really do put all they can on the racetrack. Um, and that, and that goes to show in the performance this year that in my opinion, there has been a bit of an uptick in the overall performance of the JD motorsports cars. And, uh, it showed in my first race at Pocono, we ran inside the top 10, you know, it, it showed this past weekend at Darlington when we got, when we came from the back and went all the way into the top 15, you know, I was running about uh, 15, 16, 17th when I got in the wall and I caught the oil. So, I mean, there's, there's definitely a lot of good speed in our cars and uh, it's opened up a whole new opportunity for myself. And uh, it, it teaches you a lot because you don't, you don't go out there like those guys, like Ross and Denny, they were out there slamming doors, slamming each other in the wall. It was classic racing, but you know, you look at a team like JD, we can't do that. We don't have, the body panels we don't have the influx of race cars you know we we go out there and start slamming into people we got to remember that we got to use this car next week or a week from now like it's it, it, you have to keep that in mind when you're racing with these cars because everything has to be used again that's it's important because like look at where we're at we're later in the season and your team still has speed like you said you got to reuse these cars and it's something that i think mark and i can both attest we love seeing JD Motorsports run well, but normally it was on the shorter tracks, you know, those one-off weekends where the uh, cup guys were not in town, but they got to shine. Now they're shining on on the bigger tracks, like you said, Pocono, uh, Darlington's yeah. a super speedway too, that got speed there, so it's good to see that they're all running with top 20, top 15 pace. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really been a fun experience too, you know, it, it's cool to see the team having that, having that speed and being a part of that as well. You know, we're seeing a lot of great energy within the team. I mean, you look at Pocono, we, even though, yeah, we, there was a little bit of attrition there with the leaders trying to get into each other, but even before that, we were well inside the top 15. So, you know, it, it's, there's days like Darlington where you got to look at the performance over the result and the performance was there. All four JD cars were well inside the top 20, some even in the top 10 when that happened. I think Jeffrey was running eighth when he got into the oil and hit the wall as well. So you know, it's not just a coincidence thing anymore. It's okay. We're legitimately getting better. We're growing as an organization. And, you know, there's races where I'm, where I might not have all the equipment necessary to go out there and compete, but even then we're still out there pushing the limit and going out there and putting the results on the table for JD. I oh, mean, that's awesome. I was going to ask you about, um, that sort of competition level uh, just outside the top 10 in Xfinity. Cause I know a lot of people like to make the uh, assumption that Xfinity only has 10 or 12 competitive cars, but what is that fight like from 10th on back? Like I'd say, you know, some of the best racing is between 10th and 25th on an Xfinity weekend. I mean, yeah. I mean, you look at it, the difference from 25th to 15th in the purse money is huge. And so that's what every racer out there is pushing for. I think uh, Mike Davis over at Junior Motorsports, he put out an article for D Dirty Mo Media just recently about how his experience working with Ross when he driving the 77 car at Darlington, when he finished 29th versus 30th. So, I mean, that's just the difference there. And that's in the cup field, 
running way further back than what even we are. And that's that doesn't that's not meant to come across as like an insult. That's meant to like show the difference in that. You know, you you have to go out there, race smart, bring the car home in one piece. And that's and that's why I remember I hit when I hit the wall. Uh, <laughs> that's that's a great way to start a sentence when I hit the wall. Um, when that happened, when I got, you know, into that oil and slammed the wall, uh, the first thing I said was I came on the radio and I knew Johnny scans all the radios and I came on the radio and I said, Johnny, I am sorry. I have no idea what happened. And, you know, I was afraid that, you know, something just broke and that happened. Well, right when I hit the wall, I, I'm obviously looking forward and I see four other cars along in the wall along with me and another two spin out the next corner and then the leaders wreck the next time by. So there was definitely, I, I figured out really quick that it wasn't a me thing, but even if it wasn't a me thing, I still, I still feel bad about tearing up that equipment. Um, you know, cause like I said, you have to reuse it. You know, I went to the shop and checked out the car on Monday and it was, you know, they were, they were almost done finishing up the front end It knocked on, it knocked the AR mount in quite considerably taking it added toe and a bunch of camber to the car. So to the right front and, uh, so I was using probably 35, 40% of the tire instead of what I needed to be. Um, just stuff like that, that takes you out of contention really quick and you have to keep yourself in check with all that. And looking at this season, some of the teammates uh, that you've had, you know, you've, you've been teammates with Jesse Little, Jeffrey Earnhardt, BJ McLeod, and another young guy, Colby Howard, like, and some of these guys have, uh, you know, a lot less experience than a lot of the guys in the field. Like, how has it been, you know, to be able, have you been able to reach out to them, you know, call or text them for like insight going into a race week? Cause you also, you have no practice. Yeah. That's something that's been really cool. Um, for me, my, my schedule has been, even though like you look at a driver like Colby, you know, he's proven that he has a lot of speed. He's done very well on the race car, but you know, that's, there's the difference between my schedule and Colby's is he has 20 races. I have, I've only done three so far. So, you know, yeah, he's going to these tracks for the first time, but I'm also going to these tracks months apart. My last time prior to Darlington was in late July. I'm sorry, early, it was either late, late July, early August. So, I mean, you're looking at a month's difference from each time that I get in the race car. So not only am I limited on my track time, but I'm also limited in the amount of times I'm actually in a race car. Um, and that's been very helpful to lean on drivers like Colby, um, you know, talk to Jesse. And then I've even, I've said it again and again, the, the two people that have helped me out the most this entire time have been Jeffrey and BJ McLeod. Um, and I'll say this, and I will vouch for this any day of the week. If you are watching the Xfinity series, keep an eye on BJ McLeod on the ticker. Every race, this past race, this past weekend, he was driving the 78, his own car finished 14th. <laughs> like i mean bj mcleod he's probably one of he's probably in my he's been what my opinion one of the top five drivers in the series right now and that's just you know he, he i think if you were to put him in a you know a gibbs or a jrm or a penske car he would probably go out there and contend i mean i just genuinely think bj is that good of a driver and it's been really helpful to lean on guys like bj especially jeffrey as well he's been around the block so many times he is one of the more you know concise drivers that i've had the pleasure of working with. I actually do road crew with JD when I'm not in the race car. And I'm actually going to go to Richmond tomorrow and work with Jeffrey on his car again this weekend. So learning all this other stuff has been very valuable given that there's no practice. Speaking of being like as, as hands-on as that, you, having a, a role on the road crew, what's that like? Uh, you know, cause you speak to this upcoming race, you're going to have some kind of job. What is your role normally when, when you're going there with the team? Yeah, so I'm just part of the crew, really. Um, you know, I help go through tech and, you know, help with any adjustments they need. And obviously, now that this weekend is a doubleheader weekend, after the race, I go into the car and I help, you know, nut and bolt things, clean off the car. Because you think about it, it's, I think it's a 200-mile race. So you got to prepare the car for a, from a 200-mile race one day to a 200-mile race the next day. So you have to go through and completely just redo the car. Um, so I'll go in there and I'll help with Case and – Jeffrey on their car and it's helped me out a lot get an understanding of what goes into each race car um you know in the past you know growing up it was me and my dad and you know whoever else we had helping us so it wasn't always a very big um 
it wasn't a very big crew that we always had when I was racing late models and street stocks and band loans. It was just me and my family. So now that I'm having this opportunity to do this with JD Motorsports on the second stage of motorsports in America, Xfinity, like it's, you know, it's cup Xfinity, you know what I mean? Like it's, I'm learning as I go. And I think that's been probably one of the most beneficial things as, as I've had for my racing career. And it's, it's shown on the racetrack, I feel as well. You know, I go out there, I, even though I'm not in the race car every week, I'm in the garage and I'm talking, you know, I'm talking with these drivers, learning off my teammates, learning about the race car. You know, I'm going to go on the track this, like, say if I went on the track again this weekend, all those guys in the field know who I am, not because of me, you know, going out there and racing. They know who I am because I'm underneath the race car trying to help as much as I can and learn as much as I can. There's a little bit of that respect factor there, too. So, um, I I hope, (laughs) but, um, it's, it's definitely been a really cool opportunity to do that. That's cool, man. Cause you know, you gotta be at the track to, to get your face out there. And sometimes you, even like you said, if you're under the car, it doesn't matter. You're getting your face out there. Cause people are knowing that you're working under the car and that's really cool. That's a, a lot of experience. That's invaluable for, for a driver, especially learning the car. You know what I mean? You get to physically uh, yeah. touch every part of that car and you get to understand what it is a little bit. Well, yeah. I don't know what, what, what limitations do you have on the car? So, I mean, it's really just, you know, obviously just from race to race, it's just the small adjustments, obviously, like, you know, hey, let's do this with the track bar. Hey, let's take this out of the front spring. You know what I mean? It's small stuff. You can't really do many, any real big changes or else you'll go to the rear. Um, It's working on the car in between the double header race. It mainly consists of nut and bolting, cleaning and small adjustments. That's basically it. If you, you know, worst, worst case scenario, you go to a backup car and you have to rebuild, you you have to build an entire car from the ground up. Um, that's another thing too, you know, with these doubleheader weekends, you know, you look at, you know, these bigger teams like the JGRs and the Gibbs and that's and JGR, JGR and Gibbs are the same thing. Joe Gibbs racing and junior and Penske, you know, all those guys, you know, and this isn't a bad thing. This is a, you know, and it's a testament to what those guys can do. They can go out there and race and they have a backup car for each car. JD, we have a backup car for all four or, a ba- or two backup cars for all four. So I, I don't know how many it is. Usually it's usually just one. So you think about it. If Jeffrey and BJ or Jesse and Colby go out there and have an issue and get in an incidents, what do we do? So you have to keep that stuff in mind. And that's where, you know, the time in between the races really matters the most. And do you oh. feel, I was going to ask you about wrenching on cars. Do you feel like with wrenching on cars, and, and having a great understanding of how the car drives and how it works, do you feel like that gives you an advantage over maybe some of the younger guys coming up who who might not know a lot about the mechanical side of the car? I, I think I wouldn't say it necessarily is an advantage, but it just it, it, it's it's knowledge. It's knowledge that you get about the race car. I get in the race car. Same thing at Pocono. I went in the race car and I felt what I I felt what I believed was what we needed in the car. I came on the radio. We did the change. It worked. So. You know, every time I'm underneath the car, I'm learning something new. I ask Case, the crew chief for the zero car, I ask him, hey, what'd you do there? Or how is that going to help it? And if there's something that I don't know, I'll ask him. I'm like, hey, what is this supposed to do? Like, because, yeah, I'm underneath the car and I'm helping and all this stuff. But I probably know 20, 30 percent of what I need to know. I'm still so new to all this. I could barely tell you how to put together a motor. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's it, it's stuff like that. It's just I, I want to learn. I want to learn how to work on this stuff. And do I envision myself being a crew guy? No, but I want to be able to know that. I want to be able to work with these guys and get that respect from them. And that's another thing. It's just about earning that respect as well, not just amongst your own team, but amongst the other teams in the garage as well. Um, it's 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 really shown. I mean, it's I, I would say this. I'm going to kind of tell like a small story. Uh, I, between 2018 and 2019, I had lost my ride in the K N series. And uh I went from team to team kind of like asking for rides and you know, handing out my resume and I went to a couple Xfinity teams, obviously not looking for a ride, but looking for advice. And one of those people that I went to asking for advice was Mike Davis at Junior Motorsports. I met him the year prior. Um, didn't really, you know, obviously and I told him, you know, flat out when I sat down, I said, Sir, I'm not here to ask for a ride. I'm not here to even look at that. I'm not ready for something like this. I want to ask you 
what should I do? And he told me, be in the garage. He told me, be in the garage, racing the trucks, racing Xfinity. Do what you can to be in front of people. He said, race anything and everything. Be the guy that people will call. So, you know, that's kind of where I'm at right now. And it's, um, I'm enjoying every bit of it, honestly. <laughs> oh, that's great, man. Like, cause there's a, there, there can be conflicting opinions about that. Like some people would say, don't take rides with small teams cause then your results won't be good. And then that'll, you know, taint your, to people who only look at racing reference that will taint your, uh, you know, yeah. your, your career. But I, I like the approach you've taken of just, you're so young, right? Like just get as much experience as you can. I mean, that's the big thing. Cause you know, yeah, I'm racing with J- JD Motorsports and I see them as a good home for a little while now. Um, but obviously the, the big end game is to make it to the cup series and to race with the bigger teams and stuff like that. And, you know, you have to take these steps to get there. If I were to, you know, find, say, if I were to magically find a million dollar sponsorship and go run X races at an RCR or a Gibbs or a J- J- JRM, you know, who's to say I'll do good? I don't have experience. Like, I'm not going to go out there. You know, I can go out there and run 11th, 8th to 11th, um, probably even, you know, maybe higher, maybe further back. But if I don't go out there and win, what's that going to say about me? If I go out there in a you know RCR, a Gibbs, or a Junior Motorsports car and don't win, it doesn't look good for me. So people are going to say, "Oh, well, that's a winning race car. Why aren't you winning races?" So you know you have to kind of put that all in perspective as well. Yes, it'd be valuable experience, but you know me racing with JD, it's, a, it's opened up an opportunity for me to race, get my experience, and work hands on with these guys and try to not only build myself up, but, you know, try and help grow those around me as well. And it's been a really, really awesome opportunity. Right on. Very level, very down to earth, very humble, Ryan. I got to love that outlook for you. And you're going to go far yeah. if you keep your head on your shoulders like that. Thank we want to take a, a trip down memory lane really quick though. So yeah, let's do you've it. been, you've been racing for about almost oh, over eight, eight years, correct? Uh, wow. Yeah. Eight years. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I still feel so fresh to this, but yeah, eight years now. 20 started in 2012. Well, I mean, yeah. So what, what you started in Bandoleros, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yes. Bandoleros. So what, what was that experience like? Uh, I, I know it's, uh, as advertised, a very affordable form of racing for a lot of drivers mm-hmm. to get their feet wet, get in and very big car counts, a lot of big competitive fields too. Yeah. Bandoleros. I, I can't say enough about that series. It's, it, it's, it's easily what has gotten me into the sport, gave me the bread and butter, bread and butter knowledge of how to drive a race car. You know, teach you to be aggressive, keep your car in one piece, and finish races. You know, bandoleros, they're very sturdy, very tough, but it's also very easy to break them and end your day. So you have to learn how to keep the momentum up, keep your car in one piece, and race. Um, I started when I was 11. I was 11 and a half at the time. Um, and even then, I was behind the eight ball. Um, everyone else had began racing when they were five, six, seven years old. So you think about it, I was already three, four, five years behind everybody. So I would show up and, you know, it was me and my dad and my mom. And, you know, my dad didn't know nothing about race cars. I didn't know anything about race cars. I just wanted to do it and I sucked at other sports. So here's my way to kind of try it. And, uh, you know, the first year we did it in 2012, we won the state championship. Um, granted, it was kind of one of those, oh, well, you know, there was, since there was no tracks open in California and like the eight people that were competing only ran a few races, here you go, here's a championship. <laughs> but, um, you know, first year, won a straight state championship. And then, you know, moving forward in 2013, we won 20 some odd races, um, won state championship again. And then 2014, you know, and this just kind of as an emphasis on the affordability, we ran 50 races um, on our budget. We ran 50 races and won 40, 46, 47 of them. And that was, uh, we tied for the national championship and won the state championship. And I think we still have five track records to this day. So it's just one of those things where it it goes to show how quick you can develop in a, band, in a race car, you know, if you just kind of put your time into it. Um, most people, when they're in Bandoleros, they're in a hurry to grow and get out of it. You don't want to do that. Um, and here I am saying that, you know, people are like, oh, well, you're 19 racing Xfinity. Isn't that a big jump? You know? Yeah. 
it is, but you know, you have to just kind of play your cards right. And this is kind of where my cards landed me. <laughs> yeah. And to your point, I, I think a lot of people, they get blinded by the, uh, jumping up to the legends car. Cause they're like, Oh, I'm at the bandolero. Mm -hmm. I'm not at the top of this form of racing, but it's like, it's still racing, very competitive, especially yes. for the age group. Yeah. It's, it's so important to just, it, it's, I would rather see a kid be who started racing bandoleros at eight years old, drive bandoleros until they're 13, than rather see a kid jump in at age 11 and get out at age 12. I would much rather see that eight to 13 versus 11 to 12, just because it helps you develop as a driver. I trust the, the, that kid who was in this car for far longer jumping into this versus that kid that just suddenly went, okay, I'm going to go to legend car now. I actually do a lot of driver coaching myself and the kid I work with, he's been in Bandoleros now for three years. So now it's like, all right, you know, it's time to start looking at those cars and start moving up. You know, you've won so many races at this point. You've won so many championships. Let's get you in a, in a different car, see what you can do. So um, it's just all about the development. You can't rush development. Hmm. That's, that's a good fact right there. I think we, we need to make a t-shirt about that. You just can't rush development. Yeah, we talk about that a lot, man. Driver development takes time. It does. It, does. it really does. I mean, and that's like, and that's the number one thing. You know, I, I hate seeing, and I mean, I hate it. I like, I, to, to the core, hate seeing ads for driver development programs. And this isn't a knock on driver development programs. I think, you know, the whole intent behind a lot of them is great. I've been a part of them. I've, you know, watched all of them. However, there's a lot of cases where they try to compare driver to driver instead of saying this driver needs more experience here. This driver doesn't, you know, the last thing you need to do is have a kid in the development program and tell them you better go out there and win this race. Yeah. It's not because good for their development at all. It's not, you, it, 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 it's, that's kind of like the situation I found myself in several times because I just didn't know. I didn't have the experience. I mean, like I said, we, I've been in racing eight years. Yeah, it's a lot of years, but that's a fraction compared to the guys that I was competing with. So you got to kind of like put that all in perspective that, you know, when you're so new to something, when you're trying to develop as a race car driver, you can't put too many expectations on yourself where you're just setting yourself up for fail, for failure. And you can't just jump into top tier race cars. Just like I mentioned earlier, if I were to find a million dollar sponsorship and go take it to a big team, what is, what is that going to do for myself? Just put more pressure on me, set myself up for failure. And, you know, it could, it could end very bad. They also could end very good, <laughs> but you know, it's one of those like big, like, you know, big gamble, big reward type deal, you know? So you just got to be smart with everything, and especially when you have a budget. And everybody responds to like a different style of, of coaching, right? Like everybody mm -hmm. is, you know, some people are a pat on the back person and some people are a slap in the behind person, right? So <laughs> I think you really have to, you know, know who you're coaching, right? And coach everybody differently mm -hmm. because, you know, we're all, we're all unique, beautiful souls inside, you know? Yes. You, you have to treat everyone like a delicate flower. And then there's others that you got to throw like a stone. So, I mean, it's, it, it's like... <laughs> You know, perfect example. I talked about it earlier. The kid that I coached in the Bandoleros, he's won X races in California. However, that kid comes from trophy carts, the off road, tr like smaller trophy truck stuff. Kid's aggressive. Kid is aggressive, will drive the absolute snot out of a race car, and I have to tone it down. Versus the opposite, I coached a friend of mine back in California, and she was you know, new to it. She hadn't been very fast in the past. So I had to kind of build her up to be more aggressive. So you have to know who you're dealing with. That's just how it goes with all, with all racers. And yeah, I think that's a big point too. Like those, there's usually those two ends, the driver that you need to rein back a little bit and the driver that you kind of just need a, need a little push. So mm -hmm. I, that's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to kind of like see that and try to work with that. I really, I've enjoyed all, all, all working with all different, different people. <laughs> Very nice. So one other aspect from your career, uh, early on in racing was you were running in the super stocks around the Las Vegas bull ring, man. Now I got to ask, cause we, we ran 
one iRacing event before in the past uh, when John from Speed Visions did his uh, Speed Visions 300 earlier this season. Mm -hmm. I ran with you. I was driving like crap. I just, I didn't, <laughs> I could not figure out the Xfinity car. I was so tight. Like, like, and it was like a light switch after about 20 laps. It was like, you're tight now. I'm like, oh man, I can't drive this. But uh, yeah. back, back to the street stocks and the super stocks. Do they compare to iRacing street stocks at the bull ring? Is that like the real thing or is it slightly off? It's, it's about as close as you can get. Um, I will say this until the day I hang up the helmet. The street stock is probably my favorite race car I've driven. Um, it's big, it's underpowered, and it's aggressive. You have to drive that thing on the edge every lap while keeping the tires underneath you. Um, I jumped into that series at, at a 14, and the other youngest driver was like 20, 27. So I was the kid who kind of jumped into these big race cars who, you know, came from Bandoleros and thought, you know, it, it was, <laughs> it's just kind of funny because you don't see it much anymore seeing drivers come from street stocks, you know, come from doing that. You see a lot of kids do the band, Bandolero to Legend car, jump in a Legend car and go to late model, you know, and that kind of goes back to what I was talking earlier about the development. You know, it's, I could have very easily gotten in a late model after I was done with Bandolero racing, but what good was that going to do? It was just going to, again, set me up for failure. Um, you know, we jumped in a street stock, bought it, um, came with the, came with the car and the trailer, spare parts. I don't think we, I think we did one change on the race car ever Really? in the year we had it. I think oh. we made one change and I think it was like a track bar adjustment um just to make it a little looser um and that was it for the entire year we had three race old tires you know same old same old and we went out there i think we won two races um and i think we had like i think there was only two races that we didn't finish outside the top three so it was just one of those cars that just worked really good um really fit my driving style i had a lot of fun doing it and uh it was, it, it's one of those cars that like, I always, I always a credit to kind of what taught me what I know. Mm. That, that's a, that's a great insight. So, you know, if kids want to go out there, have some fun, normally it's like, I don't know, I've seen anywhere from 2,500 to five grand for a street stock. It's a, it's a very yep. affordable weekly very form affordable. of racing. Oh yeah. Very affordable. That's, and even that kid that I was telling about that I was coaching, they, all these stories connect in like funny <laughs> ways. But, like, I even told them, I was like, look at their street stock. Let's get this kid racing. Because the thing is, you look at a, le a legend car, the motor, if you blow up a legend car, which if you guys have been around racing, you know legend motors blow up a lot. Oh, yeah. And and um, they're and they're, they're always pushing power. You're almost, like, redlining yeah. it every race with the gear. So you have that. You have that high risk of blowing up motors. Those motors are $4,500, $5,000. Versus if you blow up a street stock motor, you could buy a 602 crate. In that 602, yeah, 602 crate, you know, for 3,500, four grand, and it'll last two years. Mm -hmm. It's it's one of those things where it's like, it, it makes sense if you're on a budget and you're trying to develop as a race car driver. You're going to go out there, you're going to race against guys who are two, three times your age, and bang door to door, race hard, you know, and have to drive a full body stock car. That's another thing. It's a full body race car, so mm -hmm. you got to drive with you know the in you have to learn how to handle a full-size race car versus driving you know a smaller overpowered race car which both have their own different things both are great it's kind of like what do you want to do what can you do mm -hmm. and i think another enticing thing too for uh for everyone who likes uh weekly racing or just short track racing is that the payout at the end of the night normally about every class gets some kind of money so it's you know it's mm -hmm. nice little gas money going back towards you nice Nice to see that you don't really get that too much in the bigger uh, forms of racing sometimes, especially like go-karts. There's there's no yeah. money to be had at all. So there, there's yeah. just uh, always other options to entice and to think about. Now, something, yep, you've, yeah. Yeah, now something you've worked hard on uh, off the track is building your brand, the Rhino Gang. And you have really taken the last year to, uh, to launch this and do it the right way. What has that experience been for you? And what are some of the biggest takeaways uh, that you brought from that? Um, yeah, it's building a brand is probably 
it's, I say this a lot, you know, when you're starting to push into the upper levels of the sport, you know, the Arca, the truck, the Xfinity, you know, if you're going to go out there and just be a race car driver, you already lost. Um, you can't just be a race car driver. Driving the race car is the, re- is the reward for doing what you do off the track. Um, you know, if I wanted to do that, I very well could and waste, all, waste you know, money, waste other people's money. I could do that all I want. But it just doesn't make sense. If I want to stay in the sport, I have to have fans. I have to have support. I have to find sponsorship. And, you know, with the Rhino Gang stuff, it was so important to me to connect with those who support me. Because, I mean, we spoke about it before. I kind of just jumped into the sport, you know, fairly green. None, none of my family raced. I didn't race. My dad didn't race. You know, there was no fan base behind me. We don't have a last name that, you know, is the legacy name. You know, there's no money behind me. So you have to go out there and make that name for yourself. And if that means, you know, doing interviews, if that means, you know, posting memes on Twitter, if that means having fun on TikTok, acting like myself, then I'm going to do that. You know, I do get a lot of flack from other racers saying, how are you on social media so much? How do you do that? And it's like, because it's fun and you have to. Like, if you're going to be so reserved behind the scenes, you're not going to have fans. It, you you have to build that that fan base and connect and that's kind of the most important part now that's really the direction like the sport's going now like and we're seeing it with with drivers getting sponsorships and partnerships that might not be having the success we expect them to have on the track but they're killing it on social and with impressions and 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 companies are really becoming more open to sponsoring them because they have such a great public voice and a platform yeah, and it's all about how you use your platform too. You know, I, you know, if you're just gonna, you know, not update, if you're not gonna share your opinions, if you're not going to, you know, engage with your fan base, then you're just wasting not only your own time, but those who support you's time, in my opinion. You know, some may have a different opinion on that. I think, you know, the best way to retain fans, to, you know, grow your brand is to connect. I mean, I'll go to a race, you know, I'll go to NASCAR races, you know, last year when, you know, pre-pandemic, um, I would go to these races and sit in the grandstands and I would have fans who would come up to me while I'm sitting there and ask for my autograph. And I'm like, hey, sit down, let's watch the race. Like it's, it's stuff like that where it's like, I, I never imagined myself being the guy who would have people walking up to them asking for an autograph. So it, it means the world to me that someone wants that. And so I'm going to kind of like try and relate to them. Like, cause I was that guy. I was the kid that was running up and down pit road at Fontana in 2009 when Jeff Gordon was wandering by, I was that guy. And so it, it means a lot that I'm starting to get to that point and I want to keep growing. So I am to that point. That's big right there. I mean, if you can fill Superman shoes, I mean, one day that'd be big, but that's pretty cool just to have, uh, I, I've seen fans interact with you when you're at the track and you're just in your plain clothes and you're always very approachable. And I, that's a, that's a key thing to, for a lot of drivers just to be approachable, understandably at the cup level, you know, they got their mm-hmm. things to do, but you're always a very approachable driver. And that's, that's a great thing to see. Yeah. It's, it, it, that's to me, that's the number one thing. It's just being that guy you can go up to and ask about racing or talk about you know nuggets or something like that i don't know i i'm always up for a conversation i always like connecting with people um it's really really cool hi everybody it's mark from flashback to the track and i don't know about you but things are starting to reopen around me including the gym and physical fitness is a huge part of my life I used to play football i'm a big runner a big weightlifter and i've been able to go back to the gym and just rocked a pretty crazy leg day so I'm a little bit sore I can feel like tomorrow it's gonna be pretty bad but luckily I have some awesome stuff to help me get over that let me introduce you to the blue emu recovery bath has magnesium emu oil and menthol to help ease your sore and tired muscles after a long day of working out or being on your feet if you're very active in your job 
put it in a foot bath, feels great. Put it in a full bath, lay your whole body in there. It's unbelievable. Way better than a regular tub or just Epsom salt. I absolutely love it. I've used it a few times already. Really enjoy it. It makes me feel incredible, especially after a really long run. I ran a half marathon not that long ago, sat in the tub afterwards, felt incredible. So guys, check out the Blue Emu recovery bath. And you know what, as we always say, tell them that flashback to the track sent you. Because that would help you. So we'll ask you about uh, Wendell Scott Trailblazer Award because you actually received the award in 2016 uh, and 2017. And it's an award that's presented to an outstanding uh, minority or female driver. Uh, it's in, up there. It's blurry. Both in, of them. <laughs> in what was the uh, NASCAR Wheel and All-American Series. So uh, you want to just tell us like a bit about that and what that meant to you? Yeah, it, it's really, it does mean a lot, you know, being a being a minority in NASCAR, it, it, it is something that, you know, I don't consider myself different from others. I just want to go out there and race and have fun. Um, if I wasn't having fun, I wouldn't be doing this. Um, but it is something that I feel is very important in NASCAR to kind of break that stereotype, which I think recently has been very much, you know, starting to, you know, be broken. You know, I tell people all the time, you know, hey, I race NASCAR, you know, back in California when I'd say that's my friends and they're like, oh, yeah, so that redneck sport. And it's like, no, you know, it's it's a very welcoming environment. I've been, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time have been, you know, completely welcome. And it's it's such a great environment to be a part of and all the efforts that, you know, the, the driver diversity program, you know, rev racing when I was a part of that. Um, it all is really incredible to be a part of and to have received not just one, but two awards in Wendell Scott's name. Um, Wendell Scott is an absolute pioneer for NASCAR. Um, to do that and have gotten it more than once is insane. Um, and that's something that I'll always have on my resume. Like I said, there, ah, there they are. So, I mean, very nice yeah so there and that that's a tough award to, to 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 receive even just to be nominated you know they take 500 people and they windle it down from there that's just that's a lot um and and you speak about the diversity in the sport and for sure it's been getting much more diverse over the last decade i gotta say that how do you feel about that do you feel a good wave of momentum going to see where the sport could go in the next 10 years 100%. I think everything that has, you know, from what I've been a part of, from what, you know, I've had the, the pleasure of doing with NASCAR to, you know, what the sport has done, you know, on the efforts on their end. I mean, one of the things I look heavily upon, you know, yeah, it was kind of overshadowed by bad news. But I mean, you look at the display we had at Talladega, you know, earlier this year, you know, yeah, it was overshadowed by the unfortunate, you know, misunderstanding. But look at the uh, sh like presence of unity on pit road that we saw. When have you ever seen that in auto racing? You know, Formula One has done a great job of it, you know, but to see the entire field, all the crews, all the officials get together and do that, that is awesome. And that message should never be covered up. No, that's, that's a very, very valid point. We should always remember that and, and just remember that we're all united because we love this sport. The sport is what unites us. Nothing oh, else not. matters. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Oh, except except for family. Family always matters. Family's first. Oh yeah, that, that's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of uh, of family, y you've mentioned yourself as a member of the NASCAR family, and uh, mm -hmm. you've had some pretty interesting throwbacks in your time in the NASCAR family. Obviously, your Jimmy Johnson throwback this weekend was pretty awesome. Uh, I really have to give a shout out to your sponsor because they're the ones who obviously allow for these throwbacks to happen. Their brand recognition takes a bit of a hit, but for them to get that throwback out there, that's great on your sponsors for doing that. Uh, well, the one I, I really uh, loved early on in your career was your Tommy Ellis throwback. Yeah. During, during the, to one of the greatest competitors in the Xfinity Series history, mean to you at such a young age in your career. Yeah, and that's... And that's one of the things is that I was so young into all this that I really didn't understand the gravity of running that scheme. Um, but looking back on it, you know, it's so, it was so incredible to have that on there. And, 
Um, and I'm just going to be straightforward. We sucked that weekend. <laughs> we <laughs> straight up were terrible. Um, but, you know, to rebound like we did, I think we ran that same sch- we ran that same paint scheme at Iowa. And we ran inside the top three, had a shot to win the race until we had a entire tailpipe go through the nose of our car. Um, but it was a really cool opportunity. I love throwback weekends. I love throwback schemes. I'm a very big advocate for I'm a very big advocate for not having wraps. <laughs> true if paint. Utilize, if you could utilize the true paint, like the JD scheme we had at the Darlington, the Jimmy Johnson scheme, that was a half wrap. We used the same red. Like it's mm. for me, I was like, that looks incredible. That's what I like. <laughs> um, it just looks so much more clean to me having the true paint of a race car versus fully wrapping it. I think that looks really good. And who cares if it adds a little bit of weight? It 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 looks better, and that makes it faster. Come on, oh, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> big, time. Um, way big, way big. Uh, one one aspect that I want to ask you about rev racing, um, is working with Max Eagle. Now I'm always uh, a huge fan of Max for what he does in the sport, um, especially when he was back at DEI in the in the late 2000s. Yep. Well, what was it like, uh, to be around him? Did you get get anything from him? Uh, that you could take away and learn from using in your career? Yeah, you know, I can't, you know, there's no denying the opportunity that I got at Rev Racing is what first got me into the sport. And that's something I'll always be grateful for, especially to Max. Uh, Max has been a real big innovator in NASCAR, in the sport. And uh, it's been fun to, be, it was fun to be a part of. It's fun to watch. Um, Max is a great guy, and uh, I wish all those guys the best with what they do because it's it's a really cool, it's a really cool program they got. Right on. So we're gonna ask you a couple rapid fire questions. Now, Mark and Let's I put it. this put this together. It's some fan questions plus some uh, some of our questions that we we feel pertain very well to Mr. Ryan here. So, Mark, why don't, why don't you get us started right here? Well, I'm going to go with a softball first. So what is your favorite track? That was a fan question we got. Favorite track, Iowa Speedway. Um, set, if it's a close, it's a, and then in a close second is Irwindale Speedway. Okay. Two very good multi-groove racetracks. I love it. <laughs> very nice. Uh, so what is the best frozen chicken nugget brand? I had Purdue Nuggets for the first time today. They're not my num- They're not my best. Um, if you go in the grocery store and they are Tyson air fried nuggets. Air fried. Those are good. And they air have to air fry them, right? Like it's you can't air, just... you, like you don't like it's air. It's breaded with air fryer and all that stuff instead of actually fried. Um, oh. It's like it's nice. Like you you could you'll find it. It's it's pretty good. I love it. Adding that to my Instacart shopping list now. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a solid it's a solid nug choice. Have you ever had the meatless nuggets? I have. I have them in my freezer. Nugs. Um, they are very good. Um, they are surprisingly very nuggy like, and I appreciate the effort that has gone into those. What what brand do you have of those? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, they're called nugs. Um, nugs. Yeah, it's hmm. they're a pretty cool uh, company. Um, I was able to talk with them a little bit and they're, they got a really cool brand behind them. So nice. I'll have to check those out. So, yeah, if it, it, so if it's fast food after a night at the short track, where are you eating? McDonald's. All right. Golden um, arches. Yeah. You really can't go wrong with it. I mean, um, on the West coast, if I was racing on the West coast, it'd be a very close tie with Del Taco. Mm-hmm. Um, I love if, if you guys haven't had Del Taco, you have to have it. Um, their fries are just exceptional. Um, I always get the soft chicken tacos. They have like this sauce they put on it. I don't know what it is. It's white. Um, it's creamy. I don't know what it is. It's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> it's not queso, but it, it it's looks not like queso. It, oh, okay. it, it's yeah. I don't know what it is. I mean, it's it's oh my god. Just thinking about it. That was good. That's some good stuff. So we have to ask this next one because I saw the video of the guy uh, who I guess was trying to sue the county or whatever. But just are bring, boneless bring it up, yeah. are boneless chicken wings just just chicken nuggets or, or what is it? 
all boneless wings are chicken nuggets, but not all chicken nuggets are boneless wings. Elaborate on that. <laughs> all boneless wings are chicken nuggets. Think about that, all right? So it's that, like, it's that heavy bread, heavy fried, sauced up. However, would you go to McDonald's, order some nuggets, and call that a wing? No. But exactly. are, are, are we just being yeah. duped, though? Or not? No. It's just boneless creative writing. It's just creative writing. I like. I wouldn't drench a McDonald's nugget and put it in, bu- uh, drench it in buffalo, and then say, "Hey, here's a boneless wing," because it's clearly a, it's clearly a nugget. But like, the boneless wing is like misshapen. It's misformed. It's a tender that's was right in the center. Yeah, you make a compelling argument. I'll give you that. Yeah, I would. I would. You, I, I... Not all nuggets are boneless wings, but all boneless wings are nuggets. That's those are some words to live by. That's some philosophy right there. Yep. <laughs> Jeez. All right. And finally, <laughs> a, a, a great fan question that obviously always has to come up. Uh, a couple fans have asked us, who was your favorite driver while you were growing up uh, watching the sport? I was a big Jeff Gordon fan growing up. Um, and then once he retired, I was a Jimmy Johnson fan. Um, and I, ironically, both of those guys I have not met yet. Um, and I've met... 90 percent of the cup field already so i mean it's i definitely want to meet them <laughs> hopefully jimmy gives, gives you some kind of like uh reaches out to you some somehow especially with that throwback scheme because uh, oh, i cool. know i know it was really cool for you and a lot of other people to honor uh, double j like that and uh probably meant a lot because of the uh obviously the xfinity uh history behind that paint scheme too yeah that scheme just made a lot of sense to do it was um it worked out very well the way that happened. Are you gonna are you gonna follow Jimmy to IndyCar now? Um, I don't know. Um, I mean, oh, you mean like watch him in IndyCar? Yeah. Then yes. Uh, I mean, I I watch IndyCar. I like IndyCar. Um, I still, you know, and this isn't a thing on IndyCar. I still prefer NASCAR, but I love all forms of racing, and so I'm definitely gonna be watching IndyCar. I still watch it currently. Um, I think I would love to see both NASCAR and IndyCar work on some type of aero package. Cause you know, I remember someone was talking about gateway and how IndyCar's package has hurt their passing. And it's, I went, I went and watched the Indy 500 as well. And I was like, man, it's, we got to work on that. <laughs> yeah. It seems like they're a little too trimmed out. You know what I mean? They're very trimmed out. Yeah, and like I, I, you look back at like 2015, 16 IndyCar, like that was, oh, that's what made me a fan of IndyCar. Yeah, and then people complained because the cars looked ugly, but it was well, good. But it so was, the, the racing so was the good. COT. So did the car tomorrow, and the car yeah. was the best NASCAR we've had. Yeah, hands down, like the COT produced some of the most fantastic racing for at least and three I will, or four years. I will, I will die on the hill that the COT with wing is the best race car that was made. I will yeah. die on that hill. Oh, if they jet. could have just fixed the va- valence on the front instead of the splitter, it would have been perfect. But mm-hmm. nah, I'm a Gen 4 guy. I'll die on the Gen 4 hill. It's my, yeah, chi- it's my childhood, 4. and you'll never take it away from me. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I came into NASCAR when it was the COT with Wing, so that's like yeah. how I see them. But like, I just remember I went back and watched 2009 or 8 Richmond. And, like, just the way those cars were able to drive, you mm-hmm. know, with the wing. And that's something that, like, I think is kind of not talked about with the wing is how it let air get underneath underneath it and let air go to the car behind them. Not from underneath the car, but from above the car. It let, it let air go underneath that wing and get to that car behind them, and they were able to close in much easier. It was actually one of the things that they highlighted when they announced the COT. And that's what, like, they... They talked about how aerotite affects the cars back then, and here we are today still having that issue. So, I mean, I'm just saying if we slapped a wing on these cars today, it would be fine. Well, look at look at Australian supercars, right? They have that huge wing on the back, and a lot of people think that's mm-hmm. why their racing is so good. The wing looks funny, yeah, exactly. but it's great racing. It's good. I know, exactly. People hated the wing in Cup because it was ugly, and now it's like, oh, I miss the car of tomorrow. It's like when you break up with your ex and then regret it. It's like, come on. You don't know what you've got till it's gone, Joni Mitchell. Exactly. Exactly. 100%. That's so true. Oh, well. So, I mean, 
Here, here's a really good question because like most people, they always argue for the spoiler over the wing. But on your streetcar, what would you rather have, a spoiler or a wing? The wing, obviously. Yeah. I so. mean, it's just like it, it's like I gotta say, it just produces so much better race. That's why Indy. Yeah, I mean. I'm just saying. I'm just you, saying. It's you eat it, chicken nuggets, but you love to race cars with wings. Exactly. So. Wow! See, he knows. <laughs> I'm just a creative writer. I'm. You need a new brand too. manager. James is available. So I'm the monster who created uh, boneless chicken wings and still consumes yeah. them to this day. Oh my god! Uh, See, and now here's the thing: if you wanted to make boneless wings, just debone the wing. Yeah, because like the wing, a wing is different meat. It's you got some dark meat, a little bit of white meat. You know, it's it's a different kind of meat than if you had a boneless tender. You know what it is? Like you know what it is? What's up? It is. It's slimy. Hundred percent. Yeah, people don't like yeah. that. Yeah, and they don't like the fat too because you they want to like eat all the meat on the wing and they can't because there's fat there. But exactly. It's got that slime. It's got that slime consistency to it. That's, That's what it. makes a boneless wing not a wing. That's true. I have a whole new outlook on this now. Thank you, You're Ryan welcome. Vargas. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, thank, thanks, Ryan. Uh, we're we're gonna uh, probably end this pretty soon, but uh, if you want to give us, uh, we'll give you the moment and a spotlight. Plug anything. Plug whatever you want. You want. Yeah. Everything right now. Yeah. Uh, um, other than we're say... sponsored by Blue Emu, so we got to get. So our no rate. competing <laughs> yeah. products. Yes. Yeah. There's no competing yeah. products here. Um, no, um, if you guys want to check me out on Instagram, that Instagram is RTRV23, Twitter and TikTok at Ryan Vargas underscore 23. Check out the Rhino Gang brand at Rhino Gang BR on Instagram. Um, check out Richmar Flores, NutriShop USA, um, two incredible partners of mine. And uh, also make sure you guys follow myself along with my team, JD Motorsports. I'm sure if you guys haven't heard of them by now. I'm a little surprised, <laughs> but make sure you guys check out JD Motorsports as well. I just followed you on Instagram right now, so there, there it is, go. perfect. Yeah, there it is. All right, All right. Yeah. well, Brian, the last thing we'll ask you is, man, like, what does the future hold for Ryan Vargas? What's the ultimate goal, man? Well, here's the thing with that. I don't know. Um, you know, there's no, I, there's no contracts. There's no set plan if you would have told me a year ago that i'd have six xfinity races under my belt i tell you you're lying um if you would have told me two years ago that i wouldn't be i wouldn't have my ride in the arca series i'd say you're lying so i mean you know there's so many different ways i mean you look at it, at the end of 2017 we were going to quit racing because we didn't have enough money to keep going so i don't know <laughs> um the fact we've made it this far is beyond me beyond what all of our expectations were and uh that's why i work as hard as i do because i know that each step i take in racing is is further than what we wanted we well, not I shouldn't say what we wanted further than we, what we expected and i kind of want to keep exceeding those expectations right on i mean you you will keep exceeding if you keep getting your face out there you keep performing doing what you're doing uh <laughs> We got a probably uh, how many more races you got left this season? Because I know you've made a, already a couple starts. You made three. Yeah, I've made three this uh, so far this year. We're working on you know finishing up everything. Um, I wish I could say more, but we have some cool stuff in the works. So um, hopefully, hopefully soon we'll have something more formal to talk about. <laughs> That's fine. Well, at least for everyone. Keep up with JD Motorsports week week to week on the Xfinity series. Uh, they're doing really great, fielding four cars every week, which is insane for most teams to ever do. And for them to do mm -hmm. it, and as you've expressed, with the limited resources they have and the understanding of how they have to play the game, they play it very well. So, yes, definitely. All right, man. Thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, good luck uh, in in the future. And we'll be following you, man. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. I'm a avid watcher, so thank you guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for being a fan, man. Really appreciate it. Of course. <laughs>